Good afternoon. Over the past week, the world has followed the story of the sub Titan and the five people who perished in the terrible tragedy. On June 18th, 2023, something terrible happened during a diving expedition to the wreckage of the Titanic, which is located about 12,500 feet deep in the North Atlantic Ocean. Five people boarded the Titan, a special submarine, but as they descended, something horrifying occurred. The submarine imploded, resulting in the loss of five lives. The U.S. Navy played a significant role during the investigatory efforts of locating the lost submarine. In fact, they heard something shocking during the submarine's last moments before all the pressure under the ocean crushed them without warning, leaving little trace behind. The U.S. Navy had specialized equipment to detect underwater sounds. They heard something ominous when the submarine encountered trouble. However, they kept it a secret. Why? What did the U.S. Navy exactly hear in the final moments of the Titan submarine? Let's start off by taking a closer look at the submarine itself. Formerly known as Cyclops II, the Titan was a five-person submersible vessel operated by privately owned company OceanGate. Founded back in 2009, OceanGate provided crewed submersibles for tourism industry, research, and exploration. The Titan measured 22 feet in length and weighed about 23,000 pounds. Being constructed from carbon fiber and titanium, one may assume that the vessel was a state-of-the-art and robust piece of underwater technology, but this assumption could be wrong, as you will find out. The carbon fiber used to construct the submarine was actually sourced at a discount from Boeing. And the reason might shock you. It was because the carbon fiber was too old for Boeing to use on their airplanes, so OceanGate came around and acquired it for their submersibles, which are obviously supposed to be strong and sturdy. Now, it's debatable whether the old carbon fiber was truly unsuitable for the engineering of OceanGate submersibles, but what's for sure is that it wasn't an ideal move to make, considering the amount of pressure deep in the ocean. And what's worse is that Boeing later stated that they have no records of any sale being made to OceanGate, which makes it rather suspicious. In addition to all of this, OceanGate had initially refused to seek certification for the Titan, arguing that excessive safety protocols would hinder their innovation. According to OceanGate, the vessel contained monitoring systems that continuously analyze the strength of the hull, which is the main body of the submarine. Also, the vessel had life support for all five passengers for a total of 96 hours. However, there was no GPS underwater. The support ship, which monitored the Titan's position from up above, instead sent text messages to the Titan, which generally provided distances and directions. On top of this, the Titan apparently had several backup systems intended to return the vessel to the surface in case of an emergency. These included ballasts that could be dropped, a balloon, thrusters, and sandbags held by hooks that dissolved after a certain number of hours in salt water. Ideally, this would release the sandbags, allowing the vessel to float back to the surface. Regardless, the Titan could move at up to three knots underwater, and its steering controls consisted of a Logitech wireless game controller. It's worth noting that the use of commercial off-the-shelf game controllers for such applications is rather common, as the Navy uses Xbox 360 controllers to control periscopes in Virginia-class submarines, which are the Navy's latest class of nuclear-powered cruise missile attack submarines currently in service. They're known for their stealth, intelligence gathering, and weapon systems. Challenges of the Deep Sea Before we get into the specifics of the June 18th tragedy, let's take a closer look at how difficult deep sea exploration really is. 
It's easy to be in awe of aviation and space exploration because breaking free of gravity and flying through the air seem like such a feat. But in many ways, deep sea crafts are the much greater engineering challenge. Deep sea exploration is a daunting task that presents numerous challenges that are often overlooked. Unlike aviation and space exploration, where the environment is relatively predictable and controllable, the deep sea possesses a very hostile environment that comes with numerous challenges to humans and machines alike. As we've already discussed, the pressure down there is unimaginable, but it's worth pointing out that the lack of natural light makes it much more difficult to navigate and to accurately relay any information to your team. In addition to this, the water temperature can fluctuate significantly, and the corrosive properties of salt water can quickly degrade equipment. However, you may be wondering whether the US Navy also plays a role in deep sea exploration. Well, the answer to that question is yes. In fact, the Navy also has a long history of research and technological development, which has ultimately played a crucial role in advancing our understanding of the deep ocean, developing specialized equipment and techniques for exploring it, and ensuring the safety of those who venture into its depths. One notable example is the Navy's deep sea exploration efforts in the Trieste, a deep sea submersible that set a world record for the deepest dive in 1960 when it descended to the bottom of the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. The Trieste was developed by the Navy's Bathyscaphe Trieste Corporation in partnership with the French Navy and was instrumental in advancing our understanding of the deep ocean. The Navy has also played a key role in developing technologies for underwater communication, navigation, and sensing. For example, the Navy's Undersea Warfare Center has developed advanced sonar systems that allow ships and submarines to detect and track underwater targets, and its Naval Research Laboratory has developed specialized sensors and instruments for studying the ocean's environment. As a matter of fact, these very sensors developed by the U.S. Navy played a crucial role in solving the mystery behind the Titan's sudden disappearance. The June 18th Tragedy Now, it's time that we run through all the events that led up to the June 18th tragedy, from the preparations and actual dive to the subsequent search and rescue efforts. Let's uncover what exactly happened and what the U.S. Navy heard thousands of feet deep underwater. June 16th to the 17th, Preparations On June 16th, 2023, an intrepid group of explorers set out on a daring expedition to the world's most famous shipwreck, the Titanic. They made their way to the dive site on a vessel, the MV Polar Prince, a ship that was no stranger to adventure having braved through the roughest seas and harshest climates on previous expeditions. As they sailed towards the dive site, anticipation mounted among the crew. This was no ordinary mission, and the stakes were high. For many, the Titanic represented the ultimate challenge, a chance to explore a piece of history and unlock the secrets of one of the world's most enduring mysteries. The crew was composed of five people, including British businessman Hamish Harding, Pakistani investor Shazda Dawood and his son Suleiman, French diver Paul-Henri Narjolet, and OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush. Every single one of them were known to be daring explorers, including 19-year-old Suleiman, who packed along a Rubik's Cube in an attempt to set the world record for solving the first Rubik's Cube thousands of feet underwater next to the Titanic. At the beginning of 2023, the voyage was reserved with Stockton Rush, offering two reasonably priced tickets to Jay Bloom, a businessman from Las Vegas and his son for the trip. Stockton Rush proposed a cost of $150,000 per seat instead of the full price of $250,000, assuring Jay Bloom that the journey was safer than crossing the street. 
However, Jay Bloom quickly declined the offer due to concerns about safety. The trip was originally planned for May, but was postponed until June due to unfavorable weather conditions. As they arrived at the dive site on June 17th, they knew that time was running out. This might be their only opportunity to attempt a dive in 2023. Despite the odds, the crew remained undaunted. They were determined to make history and to shed new light on the Titanic's tragic story. The operation was scheduled to begin around 4 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, a moment that would go down in history as the start of an unforgettable journey into the depths of the ocean. 18 June, dive and disappearance. It would theoretically take two and a half hours for Titan and its crew to drop to the 13,000 feet to the bottom of the ocean right next to the Titanic wreck. Having clambered into the submarine's cramped confines, the pilot and four passengers sat awkwardly against the inside of the hull. From now until the end of their dive, the five of them would be encapsulated, separated completely from the world's water and air. They had departed from the Canadian port city of St. John's, Newfoundland at 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on June 18, 2023. Now, roughly 375 nautical miles to the east, they were poised to begin their mission deep down under the ocean. Via a floating platform, they and their craft moved down from the mothership into the choppy waters of the North Atlantic. The white, tube-like outline of the sub quickly disappeared beneath the waves, beginning its slow descent through the dark ocean depths to the world's most famous shipwreck. During the initial few minutes into the Titan's descent, everything was going as planned. The Titan remained in touch with polar prints up above by communicating through short-form digital messages every 15 minutes. The back-and-forth communications assured that the Titan's descent was documented and that any anomalies are addressed on time when the need arises. The communication system was just one of the many safety measures in place, designed to ensure that the crew was safe and that the mission was a success. Taking this into account, one would expect that safety would never have been a concern on board the Titan. But was this really the case? Well, it looks like that wasn't the case after all. In 2018, the company fired David Lockridge, OceanGate's Director of Marine Operations. The reason was that David Lockridge had allegedly breached his contract and shared confidential information about OceanGate's designs with two individuals as well as with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. However, David Lockridge claimed in a wrongful termination lawsuit that he was actually fired for blowing the whistle concerning safety issues with regard to OceanGate's design and engineering process. According to the suit, David Lockridge delivered highly critical updates regarding the Titan submersible's quality control to senior management and also to Stockton Rush, pointing to alleged issues such as visible flaws in the ship's carbon fiber hull, prevalent flaws in a scale model, flammable materials on board, a viewing window not rated for the Titanic's depth, and the key safety documents that were not shared with him. That wasn't the only red flag about the company. That same year, 2018, leaders in the submarine industry wrote a letter from the Marine Technology Society to the company warning of catastrophic issues with the submarine's development. Three dozen signatories, including executives, oceanographers and explorers expressed unanimous concern, particularly with the company's decision not to seek outside evaluation and testing. Despite all of these concerns and comments made by professionals in the field, OceanGate defended all its decisions and adamantly wished not to have the Titan submersible classed by an outside evaluator. Unfortunately, the company's negligent attitude soon proved to be fatal. As an hour and 45 minutes after the Titan started its dive to the bottom of the ocean on June 18th, all communications with the Titan were lost. Numerous attempts were made to garner a response from the submarine already thousands of feet under the ocean, 
but all efforts failed. At that point, if the vessel was still intact, regardless of where it was, the five people on board would run out of oxygen in approximately 94 hours out of the 96-hour oxygen supply already taken up. Considering the dire situation at hand, an international search and rescue operation set desperately against the clock was soon to begin. The 18th to the 22nd of June, the search and rescue efforts. By the morning of June 19th, the rescue mission was fully underway. The U.S. Coast Guard had started conducting a search 900 miles east of Cape Cod in collaboration with the Canadian Armed Forces and commercial vessels in the area. Coast Guard Rear Admiral John W. Mauger said in a press conference that it is a remote area and a challenge, but we are deploying all available assets to make sure we can locate the craft. Note that at this point in time, the Titanic submersible had approximately 63 hours of oxygen left. It's no surprise that time was already against them, considering the limited supply of oxygen, after which it would be impossible for any chance of survival. When doing dives way out into the ocean, just like OceanGate was, you're roughly a half week to a week out from help, says Peter Gurgis, an oceanographer at Harvard University. But there was something mysterious during these events, something that didn't make sense. For some reason, it had taken the crew aboard the Polar Prince nearly eight hours to alert the U.S. Coast Guard that the Titan had gone missing. Meaning, after losing communications with the Titan on June 18th, the crew up above on the ship did not take official action until the very next day. The search and rescue operations were led by the United States Coast Guard, United States Navy, and Canadian Coast Guard. All of them received assistance from aircraft from the Royal Canadian Air Force and the United States Air National Guard, a Royal Canadian Navy ship, as well as several commercial and research ships and remotely operated underwater vehicles, otherwise known as ROVs. The operation involved both a surface search and an underwater sonar search. Regardless, it should be highlighted that the search and rescue efforts were not met with just a time constraint because of the limited oxygen supply. There were many hindrances in the process, including poor visibility and harsh weather conditions. In addition to this, the Titan lacked an emergency radio beacon or a dedicated recovery system. Peter Gerges stated that there wasn't any way for its surface vessel to send anything down, help locate the sub, or pull them up. In other words, even if the Titan was already back up on the surface unnoticed, there was no way to locate them due to the absence of a beacon. As June 20th came around, the public was made aware of the greatest concern in this ordeal. Essentially, the Titan was an experimental carbon fiber vessel. Going dark could mean its hull had been compromised. It could mean that the craft would be fragile during recovery. It could mean that it had failed altogether. These speculations led the public to now believe that something tragic had occurred. With seemingly little information to work with, the search teams split their efforts between the surface and the ocean's depths. By the next day, on June 21st, over three days after losing communications with the Titan, five surface vessels were searching for Titan, with two ROVs searching in the ocean. More underwater robot vehicles were due to arrive on the morning of June 22nd, but they were desperately late to join the hunt. It was estimated that Titan would run out of oxygen at 7 a.m. Eastern Time on June 22nd. It was becoming a race against time, but the day was also coming to an end. Hope was lost. 22nd of June, debris found. The next morning on June 22nd at around 11.45 a.m. Eastern Time, the search and rescue operations finally came to an end. The U.S. Coast Guard announced that an ROV launched from the offshore vessel Horizon Arctic, which had arrived at the search site the night before, had found remains from the Titan 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic on the seafloor, some 12,500 feet deep. 
The first piece of debris discovered was the vessel's nose cone, part of a large debris field containing the front end of the pressure hull. During a subsequent press conference, the Coast Guard Rear Admiral stated that the debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. Following this, Oceangate said in a statement that, We now believe that our CEO Stockton Rush, Shazda Dawood and his son Suleiman Dawood, Hamish Harding and Paul-Henri Narjolet have sadly been lost. They added that these men were true explorers who shared a distinct spirit of adventure and a deep passion for exploring and protecting the world's oceans. It was now made clear that the Titan had imploded under the immense pressure below the ocean. An implosion is a term used to describe a violent and sudden collapse of an object or structure caused by an inward force acting upon it. Well, this is where the U.S. Navy comes into play. The Navy heard the implosion right when it happened. Hearing the implosion. According to officials involved in the search, a highly confidential military acoustic detection system, which was created to identify enemy submarines, was the first to detect what the U.S. Navy believed to be the implosion of the Titan submersible several hours after the submersible had started its journey. Although the Navy could not confirm with certainty that the sound originated from the Titan, the finding aided in narrowing down the search area for the vessels before its wreckage was found. A senior U.S. Navy official told the Wall Street Journal in a statement that they conducted an analysis of acoustic data and detected an anomaly consistent with an implosion or explosion in the general vicinity of where the Titan submersible was operating when communications were lost, and that the information was immediately shared with the incident commander to assist with the ongoing search and rescue mission. It was also reported that the Navy asked that the specific system used to detect this sound must not be named, citing national security concerns. It's worth understanding that the U.S. Navy generally employs military capabilities to deal with foreign threats. While the U.S. Coast Guard usually conducts search and rescue missions and manages other security related tasks. However, due to their shared maritime missions, the two services frequently work together as they did during the efforts to find the Titan. But one very important question arises. Why didn't the U.S. Navy immediately make it public they had heard the implosion? Well, rest assured that no conspiracy theory was true. The reason was actually very thoughtful and logical. In simple words, the U.S. Navy held off making public what noises it had detected because it wanted to ensure search and rescue operations continued and couldn't say for sure that it was an implosion that would promptly lead to a halt in any efforts already being employed. Now, if you're as curious as we are, you might be wondering what exact sounds were heard. Was it a loud bang or a small pop? Or was it a subtle sound wave captured by the sonar? Well, all that we really know is that an acoustic anomaly was captured by the secret U.S. Navy listening devices. It's also worth pointing out that more than one day after the alleged implosion on June 20th, buoys detected tapping sounds coming from the search area, raising slim hopes that survivors could yet be found. That sound was detected at 2 a.m. local time by a Canadian P-3 aircraft. An internal government memo obtained by CNN revealed that these unusual banging noises came every 30 minutes and were heard again four hours after the first instance. Conclusion On June 23, 2023, by the time it was clear that all five men on board the Titan had passed away due to a catastrophic implosion, a Washington Post analysis made by Mark Kensian, a defense budget expert, estimated the cost of U.S. Coast Guard operations alone at about $1.2 million U.S. of taxpayers' money, with the additional operations to recover the submersible's debris not included. 
Weeks after the unfortunate incident on June 6, 2023, it was made public that OceanGate has suspended all exploration and commercial operations. As of the date of this recording, an investigation led by the U.S. Coast Guard is underway. So far, five major pieces of the Titan have been found 12,467 feet below the ocean surface and are now being brought to shore. Among the debris, the Coast Guard says it may have also recovered human remains. What do you think of this incident? Could OceanGate have done a better job in ensuring its customer safety? Let us know in the comments below. If you found the content informative and enjoyable, please consider liking the video and subscribing to our channel to stay updated on more intriguing content about the US Navy and other maritime incidents. We value your support and look forward to your return. Don't forget to click the notification icon so you don't miss out on our next video.